What is up, people of the internet? It is me, Real American Politics, back in with a new video. And today, it is time that we discuss the changing House of Representatives congressional map. And what is becoming a Republican district, a battleground district, etc., etc. So we will be discussing where we're going to see the future battleground seats be. So... This is a topic I've wanted to discuss because we are going through a massive political realignment. Nobody can deny this. We are going through such a dramatic change over the past 10 years. I mean, there's so many of these Republican stronghold seats in the Rust Belt that just five years ago, you would have said, yeah, right, they're never going to vote Republican. Well, we're seeing a realignment. Same thing for the Democrats. There's some seats out west, in the northeast, etc., that originally we thought was impossible to flip Democrat. Now it's becoming a reality. Now again, we're going to be discussing around, I would say it's 30, 31 House seats that I would say there's a clear indication for how these seats are going to trend, etc. While at the end of the video, the remaining districts, I'll quickly run through what I personally believe will be. Most of them will be bad rounds, but we'll just have to see. Now, before we continue, I hope you enjoy these type of videos. If you do, smash that like button down below, subscribe, share with your friends, hit that little bell, follow the Twitter account in the description down below, and join the channel today. Everybody knows what to do. Just for 10 cents a day, you can join Real American Politics. Only 10 cents a day. That's a phenomenal deal to help support the daily content on this channel. So I hope you join today. All right, everybody, let's get <clears throat> into today's video. And of course, big shout out to Mary Miller Stan on Twitter. Once again, great information for helping create this video. Go follow him on Twitter. Great account, great person, great guy. He helped me make this video. So big shout out to him. <clears throat> All right. So there are a couple districts like I have marked out as redistricting to be determined. We can't make a fair assumption about these districts because... There's a good chance these seats become Republican strongholds in a matter of minutes. But there still are a couple districts in these seats that we should discuss. But let's get going. So let's start in a seat that there's no reason for this to be competitive. Montana first. Are you kidding me right now? This is such a Trump seat. It's Trump plus eight. The only reason there's potential for this seat to be a battleground seat is for the fact you have Ryan Zinke. Now, if you do not run Ryan Zinke, this is a Republican stronghold. But just for the fact you have a clown like that in this House seat who may not go away for a while, yeah, we have to put this in the future battlegrounds category just because, yeah, we have a clown there that could seriously hinder our prog progress in Montana first. All right, Mike Garcia in California 27th. Look, this seat is held by an electoral juggernaut. There's no other way to describe this. But the question is this. How long will Mike Garcia's luck keep going? I mean, to be honest, a lot of this is coming down to luck at this point. I mean, you do not win a Biden plus 12 seat. By six points, not think there's some luck involved. I think there's, he is a great campaigner and all, but at what point does this become, you know, a flip for the Democrats? But for the fact that Garcia, I think, will hold on for a while, you can still put in the future battleground category. It's going to get close, I think, in a couple of these cycles, but who knows? It's one of those seats where it may swing 15 points Republican one cycle or 10 points Democrat the next. That's the type of district we're talking about. But still, Mike Garcia has held strong there. We just got to see what happens. Michelle Steele in California, 45. The great district of California, 45. Michelle Steele. This is another battleground seat. I don't think there's much argument to be said here. She won by a much closer than expected margin than I anticipated. Now, again, Steele isn't bad. She is good on the issues, and the parts of Orange County that she's in is is a Republican trending part of Orange. It's one of the only parts. It's 
fairly Asian, but still it is a Biden plus six seat. Now, I think this is one of those seats that you could eventually, if trends hold, put it into a Republican seat, like kind of a guarantee. But it's so hard to tell because it is Orange County. It's shifted dramatically left. But this is one of the only parts of Orange that has a Republican trending electorate in it, the Asian population. But we just got to see. For now, I think this will still be a future battleground. Oh boy, this is going to hurt somebody's feelings. California 13th, John Durardi. Now, this is a definition of a Hispanic, blue-collar, working-class seat. And it is shifting Republican. But it still is a Biden plus 13 seat. And how much of Durardi's victory was because Hispanic turnout sucked in the Central Valley? I don't think it's everything. But still, I think this will be a battleground in 2024, 2026, 2028. It's shifting Republican, and I think it, there's a serious shot of it probably flipping Democrat in 24. But for the future of the district, I can see it becoming a future battleground seat. David, David Valadeo and Biden plus 12 seat of California, 22nd. Valadeo is a bit of a juggernaut, and he has a better chance of holding out. But again, this is a seat that... How long until the partisan lean of this district takes into effect? That's a problem that Valadeo may have. But again, you can make the argument it still is a battleground seat, especially if Valadeo runs again. I mean, he won by four points, overperformed Trump by 16 here. So yeah, I think you can make an argument about it. We just got to see what happens. Now we're taking a bit of a, you know, a trip, I guess, all the way to New York. And these two Long Island seats. First one, Anthony Spadso. Um, This guy's a bit unknown. He's not getting talked enough about. Yes, you know, he won by four points. And I believe a Biden plus 14 seat. And Republicans have made significant ground in Long Island. Especially because of Lee Zeldin carrying the group of representatives in Long Island. But the question is this. How much of this was because of... Zeldin and how much of it was actual trends. I think it's a mix of both, but both of these seats, I mean, in particular Santos seat, pff, both these seats, they are future battlegrounds. There are Republican signs of Republican trends in both of these seats. But again, how much of that was Lee Zeldin putting the team on his back? We just got to see what happens. Now we have a, I I would say a bit of an under-talked seat. Michigan 4th. This is a seat that Trump only won by 5, 4 points. Now, you got Bill Hazinga here. He won by 12 in what was a blue wave in Michigan this cycle. The problem for Republicans in this seat is it's Democrat trending, and the second Hazinga goes, this seat probably flips. But for the recent near future i still think this will be that battleground seat even if his single leaves it will be a close race it's a matter of will it flip we just gotta see so next we got in the great district of new york 22nd or i should say new york 17th mike lawler the guy that took out maloney the dcc chair which was absolutely hilarious when it happened on election night the only reason I consider this to be a battleground seat because Lawler has a chance of becoming the next John Catco, which would mean electoral juggernaut. But at the same time, there's a chance this guy gets knocked out next cycle. We just got to see what happens, but for now, be safe. I think this is a future battleground seat. Next, we have New York 22nd. This is what I meant about, I mixed up the order. So Brandon Williams, freaking Brandon, let's freaking go Brandon. He won. He won by a point in what was John Katko's old seat. Now, the guy in the primary that Williams run against was a rhino. And somehow, Democrats funded Williams so much, he got past the primary. And Williams is pretty good on the issues. He's fairly conservative. But the question is this. Will he even hold in 2024? And that, we just got to say for now, I think it's a strong argument to say 
this is probably one of those future battle round seats. Now, we're getting closer to the seats that have a serious chance of flipping, but this is a weird one here in Oregon. Oregon 5th. This is a Biden plus 8 seat. And if you don't know who Lori Chavez de Reamer is, she is a fascinating character. She ran as an America First candidate in a Biden plus f 8 Oregon suburban seat in Portland, the Portland sub suburbs. He, she ran as an America first candidate and she won. Now, again, like many seats here, we got to see what happens, but I still think 2024 will tell us a bit better how the seat will go. Now, this is the one that I may have to put in redistricting. Nancy Mesa's seat in South Carolina first which I will do to be determined. The redistricting process is happening in South Carolina. There's a lot of chaos about it. So we just got to see what happens to be determined, but I have my own opinions on it. Now we have Scott Perry in Pennsylvania. This one, I never realized how close this seat can sometimes be in Pennsylvania. You look here, Scott Perry only won by eight points. And sure, the top of the ballot did underperform. It's not looking that good for Republicans in this seat. And I think for now, this will be a seat that we have to watch for the next decade. But things could change. It just sucks that this became a Republican seat, potentially being into a new competitive battleground seat. Now, that's kind of that for, I would say, the Republican to battleground seats. Now we got a couple seats that I think you can make the argument that will become Republican to Democrat in the future. Starting in Colorado. In Colorado 5th, you got Doug Lamborn. And while he won by a fairly big margin, he won by 16, this is a seat that Lamborn, I think, is doing a lot of carrying. I accidentally marked it as a Republican stronghold. It's not... Within this decade, I do not think it will be a better run. I think it will flip Democrat, and when it does, it's kind of over in Colorado for that district, Colorado 5th. The reason being is the trends in Colorado Springs, they don't look good at all. But again, I understand that there's some arguments to be said about policy being the top of the ticket. Sure. But this is part of the state that's trending heavy Democrat. Now, Boebert's seat... I think this really had to do with the two clowns at the top of the ticket for Republicans. They brought down Boebert. We have data to prove. She got brought down big time. It's not like the Colorado Springs area where it's constantly shifting Democrat. Boebert's a seat that's kind of stagnant. It really isn't shifting anywhere. That's why I'm saying what happened in 2022 in Boebert's seat had more to do with the clowns at the top of the ticket. So yeah, I think overall... And that scene in Colorado will be an eventual pickup for the Democrats. Oh, another one of those seats that there's no reason for this to happen, but it's going to happen eventually. Ken Kelvert's seat in Colorado, uh, California 41st. Now, this is a Trump plus one seat, but it has Palm Springs. And it's trendy Democrat, but it definitely could be held for a little bit longer than expected. But I don't think you're going to hold on to it for that long. I think eventually that seat will flip to the Democrats within this decade. And it may be within a couple points here and there, but it's not going to be this hotly contested battleground where Republicans have a serious shot. It's going to be one of those seats where, yeah, I really do not think you're going to have much chance of, doing, of winning here. Now, these next ones are pretty obvious. I don't think I'm going to say much. David Schweikart, it's a matter of time. It's a matter of time before Arizona first fully flips. And Nebraska second, Don Bacon. There's no debate about this. Don Bacon underperformed everybody's expectations by a long shot. He is a moderate Republican. He only won by four in 2022. And this seat is zooming extremely Democrat. The fact of the matter is, yes, he did nine points better than Trump here, but... He did around 12, 13 points better than Trump in 2020. That's not a good sign for Bacon. I understand there was a turnout problem in some areas, but still, 
Bacon at this point, it's coming down to win. You only won by two points in what should have been a red wave. It was a red trickle in some areas. It's a matter of time before that seat flips to the Democrats. So that's kind of the Republican seats that you can make an argument about being battleground to potential Democrat pickup opportunities. Now we're going to be talking about some good news because this is some bad news in some areas, but for many Republican areas, there's some serious good news, or I should say Democrat areas, starting in Virginia. Now Spanberger in Virginia 7th, she is a strong uh, incumbent, but the GOP is finally starting to fix themselves in Virginia. And she is a strong candidate because she makes herself self out to be some moderate, you know, blue collar Democrat. And she's actually did some decent things in Congress. And she got support from people like Matt Gates, Brian Fitzpatrick, etc. Now, for Republicans to win this seat, they need to find somebody like Yunkin. They need to find a Yunkin style candidate, not like Vega, who failed miserably at running in 2022 but this is a seat that if republicans can get their act together they could seriously flip this seat it's a disappointment that we haven't already but it is what it is now colorado eighth there is some good news in colorado for republicans colorado eighth you have a seat that republicans should have won this this is a seat that joe or dale flat out screwed republicans over i mean seriously you should have won this seat. This was only a Trump or a Biden plus three, four seat. And you had Kirkmeyer, who was the, you know, the establishment, you know, the respectable conservative type. The fact of the matter is, this is a seat that will be competitive within the next decade. It's a future battleground. It's a seat that it's going to be 50-50 in a lot of cycles. Now we got in Connecticut fifth, Jahana Hayes. This one... This is what happens when you have clowns running the Republican Party. If Logan got support earlier, he probably would have taken out Hayes. This is a seat that shifted 10 points Republican. And there's signs that these trends are not flukes. And quite frankly, this is part of Connecticut that is trending a bit Republican. So I don't see why Republicans couldn't win this seat. I think it's a seat that if they invested more resources into, they could have absolutely flipped. They came very close to George Logan. Hopefully he runs again. If he does, you have a chance. But we just got to see what happens. This is a seat that has some signs of trending Republican. Now, Pennsylvania 14th, I'm not going to, or 17th, I'm not going to say much here. This is a seat that is a Biden plus five seat, but it's trending like, eight, nine points Republican each time Trump's on the ballot. And whoever is on the ballot in 2024, I think will make this race incredibly close. And I think overall Republicans, they waste an opportunity here. I think the candidates at the top of the ticket did hurt the Republicans here. I mean, we lost statewide by six, seven points. If we would have lost by, you know, one to two points, you're talking about this race being a coin flip. So I do think this seat will be a battle round seat. Now we got Susan Wild in Pennsylvania 13th right here. Or Michigan 13th. I'm sorry. Excuse my French. Pennsylvania 7th. It's a battleground. It's a matter of how long till Susan Wild retires. It's some parts of it's trending blue. But it also has many Obama Trump voters. Now... This is a seat that if Republicans run a good candidate and or Susan Wilde eventually retires, which she will eventually, it probably will flip. Again, it's one of those districts that there's a lot of these Trump-Obama voters that they don't necessarily trust the Republican Party just yet. That's why it's still mm, kind of close. But we just got to see what happens overall. It will be depending on what Susan Wilde decides to do now new mexico second oh this one is a stinger republicans should have won this one it's a disgrace that this guy even won gabe vasquez the guy wants to defund the police and democrats had no confidence 
They gave him nothing. The fact that Harrell lost this seat was pure incompetence for Republicans not giving him her resources. It's a total joke. But the good news is there is some signs of Republican trends in New Mexico. Plus, Harold did a lot. I mean, she did five points better than Trump did in 2020. And this is a seat that is trending Republican. So this will be a battleground in 2024, 2026, etc. Now, these are some funny ones in Florida. Starting in Florida 23rd and Let's just get all these knocked out, both of these guys. Florida, 23rd, right here in the Miami area. The fact of the matter is, this will be a battleground the next couple of years. <laughs> the fact that this is becoming a, a toss-up district shows how Republican Florida truly has become. And you could start talking about maybe a place like Florida 25 being competitive, Florida 22nd. But for now, Florida 23rd is the strongest argument for a competitive seat. Now we got to quickly go over to Illinois 17th. The guy here is not going to win. Or I should say the guy here is a weak candidate. One of the worst candidates Democrats hired. Eric Sorensen, he ran on being gay. That's all this guy ran on. And the only reason the Republicans lost the seat is he elected or nominated some rhino establishment hack that was crappy on the issues and should have won this seat. Joy Kane should have won this seat. I mean, yes, you suck on the issues, but you still should have won here. Sorensen, I think, got lucky with Republicans being pure incompetent. And I understand there's some parts of this district shifting blue, but as a whole, it is shifting Republican. Now, these were the, I guess you could say, the competitive seats that... Republicans, you could make the argument, could potentially pick up. Democrats could potentially hold on to. But I think it's time we get to the seats that I think Republicans have a strong case to be made for picking these districts up. Starting in Washington 3rd, this one's a fluke. Perez won because she did absolutely nothing. That's the meme, Luigi meme in a nutshell. She did nothing. She let the Republican Party collapse in Washington. That's how she won. She's not going to hold on in 2024. If she does, you, I, I will say certain things, but I doubt she gets close to winning in 2024, barring something crazy happens. Now, another seat in Florida, Florida 20, or Florida 9th, I should say. Darren Soto is going to lose this decade. This was supposed to be a vote sink for Democrats. Now, the fact that Soto lost against one of the worst candidates Republicans had in Florida, Scotty Moore, yeah. When is that guy going? This is a super Republican trending part of the state. I mean, look at this. It shifted even a bit more Republican than the Miami area did. So yeah, at this point, Soto's done. It's a matter of when. We just got to see what happens. Now, Ohio, Marcy Captor, it's only a matter of time. Th this district, Captor retires, it flips automatically. Look, you could make a redistricting to be determined for this district. I'm just saying not really because I'm hearing some bad signs about the redistricting process in Ohio. Plus, you have to make the districts basically a Trump plus six seat to probably get her out. That's the problem for Republicans, but the second that she retires, oh yeah, it's flipping. Now, quick one, now, North Carolina first, even without district uh, redistricting, this district's losing population right here. It's losing black population. It is some of the final white working class voters in North Carolina that haven't even flipped. I know the population, uh, I know the district has a huge black population, but again, like I said, it's losing that black population. And Don Davis, he won despite having a significant funding advantage by only four points in what was a buying a plus 60. Plus redistricting, oh yeah, good buy. You're going to be done eventually again. It's not like an automatic it will flip in 2024, but probably 2026, 2028, more than likely, it flips then. 
Now, Frank Mervin. This one, I am shocked about. I originally thought there is no way that Mervin was going to get within six points of losing, or even ten. I thought he was going to win by, like, ten points. The fact that he only won by six against a fairly weak candidate, in hindsight, she was not the strongest candidate. And he leaked some stuff he shouldn't have. Ruth Green put up a hell of a fight considering the circumstances. And his margin went down a lot from 2020. I think this is a seat that eventually Republicans will pick up. It has Gary Indiana in it. I know there's a heavy black population because of Gary, but there still is a substantial working class population when you look at the precinct data. That will flip Republican. It's a matter of when at this point. But yeah. Now we got the great state of Nevada. Nevada, 4th, Horsford, I'm not saying much. The fact is, this was a seat that trended the most Republican of the three competitive Nevada seats. Sam Peters was the most conservative candidate, had the least amount of funding, least amount of name recognition, and he did the best of the three bozos. Yeah, there's basically no way Horsford's going to hold on or this district will stay blue for the rest of the decade. Again, I'm saying in general, every now and again it may flip because it's like a Trump plus five seat or something like that. But I'm just saying most of the time it's probably going to be a new Republican seat. Now we got two more quick ones. Of course we have one in Michigan. Right here you got Dan Kildee's district. I know he won by 10 points. I understand it. This guy... He only wins by 10 points because he grifts off his dead uncle. He is one of the most extreme Democrats in Congress. And how do you even win this seat? Guess what? Run a competent campaign. Paul Young was not that good. And when you look at the fact that this was a Biden plus 7 electorate in Michigan. Yeah, you heard that. Biden plus 7 electorate. That means only 44% of the voters were Trump voters. 51% were Biden voters. The fact that this district only shifted eight points Democrat should sell, sound some alarms for Kildee. I do believe within the next decade, this is another seat that I think Republicans will eventually flip. Now, the last seat we're going to be talking about, this is the reverse Nebraska second. Matt Cartwright in Pennsylvania 8th. He only won by two points, his smallest margin of victory. And this was what was kind of a blue puddle, I guess you could say, in Pennsylvania. It was a blue-leaning environment in Pennsylvania. The fact he only won by two points, it's another one of those seats where it's a matter of time when it will actually flip. And this, folks, is, I guess you could say, the future map for the House Representatives, you know, elections and stuff. Now, the rest of these districts, we'll go over quickly. Now, the reason that I have Katie Porter's seat marked as potentially competitive is Republicans have some strong candidates here. Scott Bow, plus Porter was a probably the stronger candidate in California, uh, 47th. It's a matter of how close will it be, in my opinion. I think it will be close. Both these ne ne Nevada districts, Arizona first, or I should say second, uh, six, I should say. Excuse me. I'm losing my voice. I'm sorry. I, I think a lot of these seats, I think you can... Self-explanatory. rest of these seats, Virginia second, where the Virginia Beach area is. It shifted Republican by five and a half points. A bit more than expected. Kiggins, I think it's going to... She's going to hold on for a while, but it will be closer than expected. New Jersey, this is a seat that will be close for a while. Rhode Island second. This one a lot of people give me shit for. Fung did a, you know, he didn't win, all right? But he did make significant inroads in Rhode Island. Plus, Seth Magnizer, Magnizer, he has some stuff about him where if they get leaked to the public, yeah, I don't think he's going to hold on. Or I should say it'll be a lot closer than many people expect. And New Hampshire, I'm putting a safe Democrat that... That seat's kind of gone, in my opinion. And this, folks, is what I would consider to be the future battleground slash Republican slash Democrat stronghold map for the House of Representatives. 
If you guys enjoyed this video, which I hope you did, smash the like button down below, subscribe, share with your friends, hit that little bell, follow the Twitter account in the description down below, and join the channel today. And again, a lot of these districts are dependent on 2026, 2028, not necessarily 2024. These are seats that we're talking six years down the line. That's why in a place like Colorado, there's a good chance that district flips when you start looking at some of the trends. Anyways, folks, we'll see you guys in the next video. Godspeed to all of you.